Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Echelon Cycling Podcast. Today, we're going to be divulging Paris Nice and Tereno Adriatico that happened in the week. Two Slovenian winners, but this time reverse of what happened last year. As always, I'm joined by who should I start with? Ewan of the Cycling Dane, Ewan Wilson, and Mr. Craig himself, and Patrick from Audu Cycling. And uh, great to have you both here, as always. But before that, I just like to remind everyone that we're also available on podcast form. Every single one of them, they're all down in the description below if you're watching on YouTube. But that aside, which one do you want to start with, Paris Nice or Treno? I enjoyed Paris Nice more. I think personally, yeah, like I just said, I think Paris Nice was uh, the better race this year. I think it lacked, of course, the traditional Paris Nice crosswinds, which I think everybody was sort of hoping for in a way. But I think the anticipation of Pogaccia versus Vingegaard really drew a lot of the attention of the cycling community this week, and rightfully so. And I think it was a really interesting battle. Of course, we saw that Pogaccia was just as dominant as he as he always is. But there were some really good performances from some underdog riders like Godu really came out um, came out swinging, which is good to see. And you also saw like uh, Jorgensen Mado made a bit of a comeback as well. Nielsen Paulus. So lots of good things to be taking away from from Paris Nice. And of course, maybe it's a bit early to be speculating on Jonas versus Pogaccia, considering that Jonas lost to Pogaccia last year in Torino, but still ended up winning the tour. So maybe it's too early to say, but it's certainly round one to Pogaccia as far as I'm concerned yep i would agree it was a solid week of racing i love paris nice i think it's kind of a distilled version of, of the tour de france in one week and it also dips into different parts of the country where the tour de france doesn't necessarily always go to like um the loire valley we usually have a bit of paris nice there then moving into the sort of the Massy central and beaujolais um, yes the tour de france will be going there this year but normally it doesn't and then finishing off with the maritime alps which we don't usually see in the tour de france we rarely see the Maritime Alps in the Tour de France, actually. So it's good to see sort of Paris in action and, and in full swing. And uh, yeah, it was a super interesting addition, uh, sort of unpredictable sprints uh, across the board as well, and solid mountain stages that also with the team time trial intrigue with the different format there. It was it was an enjoyable week of racing, and we had a worthy victory. I don't think anybody can sort of question the outcome. It doesn't feel like everything turned on one stage. It felt like this was a steady sort of narrative from beginning to end, and Pogacar came out on top. Storyline of the year, isn't it? He's won more races that he started than he's lost. Dare I say it was quite a boring edition of Paris Nice, to be honest, because the last stage, <sighs> the one where we've had like chaotic editions where like Contador was trying to get the GC and lost it by seconds. Here is kind of just like Pogaccia disappeared up the road. No one could really follow. And you're like, oh, well, at least last year with Simon Yates and Roglic, there was a bit of intrigue still to the end. But I mean, he's just the best rider right now. In this time of year yeah quite literally i think the only thing that really happened in terms of gc movement was like jorgensen really managed to get into the front group well front group second group in the on the cold airs. so he moved up like a position or two maybe but yeah like you say nothing nothing really happened at all um apart from Pogaccia just rode away and then everybody just kind of fell in line and uh just kind of sprinted out but maybe the weather had an impact on that last year was very rainy which did certainly add to the attrition whereas this year was um a rather resplendent 17 18 degrees in sunshine so it must have been very nice for for the riders spring is well and truly upon us i don't think he yeah. did move up because uh, no, uh, gino matter they came back they like closed the gap but it did look like at one point he was going to be moving up uh yes yeah did he not? Well, that sucks. <laughs> it does. It does it's indeed. Just he, he, it. Rode, he rode a really strong <laughs> stage, to be fair. So yeah. it felt like he should have moved up in GC. I think in this race overall, he was definitely stronger than Balde was. He was definitely stronger than Paulus, but they played the GC game and uh, they're ahead of him in the rankings. But yeah, I feel bad for Matteo Jorgensen, but still, it's it's a good coming of age ride for him. He has finished in top 10 in Paris before, but it was sort of a more under-the-radar performance back in 2021. This performance is a lot more sort of mature. A good ride by Jorgensen. Though. Definitely a guy to keep your eye on throughout this year. He's just 23 years of age. So um, yeah, plenty of si- excitement to come out of uh, Movistar this year yeah one thing i really thought was interesting with the podium okay it was a bit boring that tata Bogaccia won but he's the first ever lamprey uae rider to win this which is staggering when you consider how far the team goes back being a goal despite finishing only third is the first ever 
Dane to finish on the Paris Nice podium. And David Godou is the highest placed Frenchman since 2002 with Sandy Cassar. So very wow. historic podium to grab. It. And then Tarugacha's second ever Slovenian after Roglic. But, uh, and then Gregor. Also, I thought that was quite a good result for him. He got the pocket jersey. All the other jerseys went to Mr. Pogaccia. We're not used to seeing him get the green one, but three jerseys, three victories is very Pogaccia-esque. Yeah, and then Godou coming in second place was arguably one of the performances of the week, in my opinion. Just the fact that on some of... I mean, it was on stage four, and then like Godou counterattacked off of the, the move of Jonas and, and Pagatra and then got up the road, Pagatra bridged up to him and then he finished in second place and I thought, well, you know, maybe he's, has he just got fortunate that go, like Vingegaard's kind of shot his bullet, so to say. But then we saw, then like the big mountain top finish, that Godou was actually really strong and stronger than Vingegaard, which does really raise the question of Godou's capabilities to finish on the podium of the tour this year because there's been a lot of drama this year about him and Damar having a bit of bickering about who's going to be leading the team at the tour, but Godu's clearly put his stake in the ground for Rupama to really rally around him. And he finished fourth last year. I don't think that a podium is too far fetched to be believing. How does he do it? I don't know. Ride fast. <laughs> Ride faster. <laughs> Ride faster. I mean, because Geraint and and Avonapol are going to the Giro. So like what's his his competition level like for for the tour? Because obviously G finished ahead of him last year, and I'm not sure who Ineos is sending. Is it like Martinez, Bernal? It's all very unproven, and I think this third space is definitely. I think that Godu actually could do it for lack of TTKs, and those which are there are pretty hilly. I think Godu's got the capabilities. Team's strong. He's strong. Why not? Bring out the bagpipes. Bring out the Bretons. Bring out the cider. I put my flag up especially. Those watching on YouTube can see. Brittany is arriving and it's the little prince who is leading this hype train. The Petit Prince de Bretagne himself, David Godou. He rode a very creative race. I think, I mean, we talk about it in football. I say we. They talk about it in football in terms of positive football and negative football. If we can sort of put those terms into cycling, David Godou rode a positive race, particularly La Loge des Gantes was very positive. Attacking when he knew that Vingegaard and Pogaccio were looking at each other, had the belief in himself to go for it as well. And then proving when he got to the Côte de la Cuillère that it wasn't just a sort of fluke uh, from La Loge des Gantes, he was strong enough to be right up there with Pogaccia. Moving into the knee stage as well, sort of being in contention, yes, leading that second group home, but still also proving that he is a top flight favourite, really. It was telling that uh, he was sort of getting rid of uh, Vingago, looking sort of more at ease than Vingago on, on a lot of these big climbs. Col de la Cuyol is, is it's a difficult climb. Yes, it's a maritime Alp climb, which is different to a sort of Savoie Alp climb, which we'll see in, in the Tour de France, which we've seen Vingago perform very well at. So it's a different format there. We see riders thrive at the Maritime Alps instead of the Savoie Alps or similarly with the, with the Pyrenees. Maybe Godou prefers this part of the world, but he looked very strong, rode very intelligently and his team were right behind him. The whole Demar thing about, well, to add context, David Godou wrote on a Discord server that he doesn't get on very well with Arnold Demar. Yes, he, he had to apologize for that. It was a couple months back, but in this race, they sort of put that aside. Demar helped him to get bonus seconds as well on stage five, and it showed that there really was strength in numbers. And once you factor in Valentin Madoise and so forth into the mix, remember Valentin Madoise, David Godou was praised for being the secret sort of ingredient to his Tour de France success last year. They have that sort of synergy and dynamism between them. Put them in a Tour de France stage, that's Synergy and dynamism will work so well. Probably better than any screen it is. I bet you that. Like the final stage as well, you saw, well, Jonas Bingo was basically isolated. There was Jan Tratnik who had been in the breakaway. He came down, but like Groupama FTJ had the most riders in that group. So that was quite good to see. So I think David Godou, former Tour of Near winner, fourth last year. It's true what both of you said that there's not really anyone else who's so clear to potentially being third favorite here. Well, um, I, I mean, I'm just looking at the star list. Oh, you're going to say I'm, someone? I'm, I'm, I'm pulling, I'm going to pull up some names. Jai Hindley. <laughs> Jai Hindley. Really? Carapaz. 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 Mas. Oh, okay, Henry, Carapaz. Henry, yeah, okay, Henry Mass. Henry oh. Mass, you know. He literally finished second at the Vuelta last year. We can't write off Mass. Landissimo, of course. How did we forget? <laughs> No, how do we go? No, how do we go I, about I'm not going to allow that. I'm not going to allow that every time. Like, on, only he disappoints me. <laughs> The Giro he was meant to win crashes on stage five or six. Yeah, that's, that uh, is yeah, true. We don't talk about that. Yeah, that but like, I think it's quite easy to overlook Jai Hindley. I, weirdly enough, I forget that he's won a Giro. 
I don't know why, but he and just kind podium. of goes, yeah, he goes under the radar for me continuously. So he's certainly a contender. And Carapaz, we haven't really seen much of at all this, this year, have we? Was it just national champs he's done? Carapaz, he's the most reliable rider in the, yeah. uh, apart from Pogacar, maybe even a goal. But in terms of actual numbers, he's the most reliable guy that we've had in the 2020s, this decade of racing. He's podiumed a Grand Tour every year since 2019. And before yeah. that, in 2018, when he was a young rider, still finished in top five of the Giro. If if he's going to the Tour de France, he's a nail on for top five. If he stays on the bike, 100%. Yeah. He's a creative yeah. rider as well. I think that'll work to his benefits. No, I'm going to look him. That would go do. That's who we're talking about. Okay, yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> but, okay. Well, Goudou has a lot of pressure on his shoulders to do this, though. We've seen because previous it's... French people crack under this pressure. Exactly. Goudou's a little bit different. He's um, happy-go-lucky. Whereas Thibaut Pinot is very, it's very, I don't like using this term, but a very emotional rider. He has a clear sort of pathos, has a clear sort of narrative behind him. A bit like Lander, where sometimes they fall into the trap of falling into their own narrative and being their own sort of disadvantage. Thibaut Pinot, more than anybody in the peloton, really falls into that. And I think Goudou doesn't have that behind him. He's a known entity in France, but he's not a household name, if I can even say Roman Balde and Pino much more household household name than Balde is, but Gurdou's a little bit less sort of known about uh, Groupama as well they'll have sort of the ability to kind of go along with it. They have a very strong team. Um, and I think as well, it's just all going to cook up to what could be a, a good couple of weeks for Groupama Francis Deja. So thinking of Jonas Vingo. We're seeing Pagacha to totally just wiped him off off the race, toying him. And it was very similar to Trendor last year. But then Jonas got better, etc. What went out, all this. It wasn't the strongest Jombo Visma team by any shadow of a doubt. Tobias Voss was base. Well, Jan Tratnik was probably the best rider he had. But uh, yeah, how does Jonas Vingol beat Tadej Pagacha in the Tour de France? Even though that he said, guys, it's only spring. Don't worry, I'll be fine. Back to teed for you, Ving Jonas. <laughs> Back up over 2,000 metres. I, I don't know, that's probably how young Bill do it. They'll put, and then they'll wrap him in the cotton wool of Wout Van Aert's lovely green jersey or something, and he'll guide him around France in some chariot of golden bees or something, and that's how Jonas will, will beat Pogaccio. I just think that, yeah, like Jonas said, it is spring. We saw it last year that he didn't beat Pagaccia in Torino, but he did still beat him at the Tour. So, yeah, it might be a bit early to make judgment. But you have to remember that this is probably maybe one of the only times we'll see them together this year before the Tour. Because, of course, uh, Pagaccia goes and does Tour of Slovenia as his warm-up brace, whereas Jonas will likely go to the Dauphiné. I think I can't remember what his schedule is. So this might be one of the only gauges that we have before going to the tour. So it is still an important thing to be kind of casting judgment upon, but it's certainly not the be all end all. I think that Jonas is definitely still capable of winning the tour. I don't think that this Paranese really changes my my overall opinion upon Jonas's ability to to be doing that or Jumbo Visma's for that matter because I don't think they really sent the strongest team here. I think that they still have cards to deploy. I agree. I think the only way Jonas is beating him is with team um, to be honest. We've seen head-to-head Pogac is a better rider. We've known this for years. Vingegaard has only beaten Pogac once at a proper stage race setting at the 2022 Tour de France and what was the major difference there? UAE, by the way, when they were a full, fully-fledged team, they were really very strong here. Yeah, Groschat, that well, was well, even, strong. Yeah, and but Tim Willens. I, I think we almost have amnesia from the Tour de France of when they had their full numbers at La Planche des Belfis. They were fantastic at sort of getting Pogacar in the right place, isolating Jumbo Visma. Jumbo Visma lost control on that stage. They only had Roglic and um, Vingago at the front. Also, yeah, look, bad, looking towards week. Longwy as well at, at, at the Tour de France, Brandon McNulty, Rafa Maika did a brilliant job there, and Pogacar won the stage. A sprint, by the way, an uphill sprint. I think we almost forget that UAE are, an, are a really, really good team. And this year is going to be very different in terms of how, how the teams sort of stack up. But for Vingegaard, they have to just bring the best team possible. To be as fast as you can drop him from the team, I'm, I'm sorry, he's not slotting into his role uh, as a domestique. He said it himself that he's sort of struggling to sort of find whether he wants to be a leader or a domestique. I understand that. He finished top 10 at a Giro at a young age. Probably gave him faith that he could be a GC leader that hasn't quite come into fruition at either stage races or at the Grand Tour setting. And he's slowly finding his way in, as, as a domestique. He probably needs more time to sort of experiment with that role. Rowan Dennis should not be there, 100%. Don't send him to the Tour de France. I don't think he's a key aspect. I think we overhype Rowan Dennis because he's had a couple of good days as a domestique. But he's, 
been sent to so many grand tours over the years as, as a domestique, and we're still talking about an effort he did three years ago at Young Bavis. I, I, I don't. I, mean, I don't. It's think... a fair point. Camino not really that great. Um, here gone zonked nowhere to be seen even in the time trial he got dropped I don't I don't rate Rowan Dennis I think what you need to do is bring Stephen Kreiswijk here I think you need to bring uh, Wout Sepkus I'm, I'm not going to mention Primoz I think he should go to the Giro in the Vuelta I'm, I'm thinking that you should rejiggle Wilco Kelderman's season to put him in the Tour de France squad I know he's scheduled for the Giro, move him to the Tour de France, and you've got a, you've got a secret weapon there because he's a guy who's done very well in Grand Tours, done very well in one week long stage races, can climb with the best. Chris Wake is super strong, quite accident prone. Walker Kelderman's quite accident prone as well, but just adding him in, into this lineup could all just provide that extra richness because UAE are bringing such a strong lineup, but they don't have a Kelderman equivalent. Mike is a great equivalent for Kurs. Uh, Felix Groschart is looking like a brilliant equivalent to the sort of Chris Wake role. And now, and now we got Domin Novak, yeah. Polans. They've got plenty of other guys who sort of slot into the sort of second tier uh, mountain domestique role. So Yumbo need to really figure out their team and maybe jiggle around their Grand Tour setup for the Giro and the Tour de France, if they can. They're quite rigid with their Tour de France squad, so it might be a, a big ask for them. Yeah, it's definitely. I think they've just got so many names, haven't they? And when you have the, the very tried and tested rulers of like the, like Wout, Wout and Art, uh, Van Hoydon could probably go. Laporte. Would you send Van Hoydon? Yeah, hundred percent. I think he's really quite underrated as a ruler. I think you know he doesn't get results, but he's a bit like it's like Luke Rowe. You know, Luke Rowe goes to goes to races because he's just reliable. Like he just he, he gets the job done. He guides people around, and I think that's what Van Hoydonk does really well. You need those people in there. I do still think that at the moment, I'd said this last week, but I still think that Jumbo's team is stronger, mano a mano. Which is how they beat Jonas last year. I mean, beat Jonas. How they beat Pogaccio last year. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Brain fart. That's how they beat they beat Pogaccio last year. Because they had a they just had a stronger team. Um, pretty much, I mean they they literally did it, executed it on like what, like hump that like one stage pretty much when they beat Pogaccio. But yeah, I think Jonas still has the capabilities. Yeah, I do like all of all of Ewan's points about kind of Yumbo's strategy, what we need to consider going into trying to balance Primoz's attack at the Giro, but also Jonas's attack at, at the Tour. It's going to be quite difficult, despite all the signings which they have made, which has put them into really the super team status which they're currently in. I could go in the defence for Jonas Vinkel. That One of the things that they've been talking about in the Danish press is that Tadej Pogacar is only in this amazing form compared to uh, Jonas Vinkel is because the classics are coming up and Jonas Vinkel doesn't care about the classics. And obviously Tadej Pogacar, Paris-Nice is seen as this tune-up race for the classics riders that was, that's why we were saying who was it that went up the road oh, Oliver Narsen they're just using this as a tune up but with that P- Tadej Pogacar probably near his 100% do you think he's realistically now a favourite for Milan San Remo and how does he win it if he is I think yes he is a favourite for San Remo I think the way that he wins it is they do something similar to last year in that they paced the Tepressa really hard I think they need to do that again and arguably try and because the group going into the Poggio last year was probably one of the smallest we've seen in, in, in a long time just because of the way that UAE paced the, paced the Cipressa. But I do remember them getting to the top of that climb and it was, you know, Formlo had to come back up to the front and he looked absolutely gassed. I think that they need to try and whittle Domestiques down and try and get that group as small as possible going into the Poggio. As Pagatra has said, so far this week, he doesn't like it when lots of people are around. He likes it being more mano a mano, keeping things a bit a bit simpler. So the fewer people, the better. So I think they're going to try and make it a really attritional race as much as San Remo can be done to be an attritional race. And I think that Pogaccia, his racing instinct, I think that he could... He won't do a Mahoric and descend like away crazy, but he could certainly grab the hull by the by the horns in the last 2Ks and just solo away to victory. I certainly think that is a possibility. I mean, last year, we had this discussion about is Pogaccia the favourite for San Demo? After watching him absolutely destroy Strata Bianca, then ride dominantly at Tirreno. Not much has changed in 12 months. He's still got that same instinct. He looks to be in very similar form. He tried last year to get away, from the other guys and it didn't work i don't quite think the climb suits pogacar enough for him to get away there are other guys with an explosive kick that could respond i think what works in his favor is that van der paul and van art both don't look that great in terms of their form van art um slid on his rear end um across italy last week 
uh, after clashing with Tom Pidcock. Uh, and then Van der Poel has been looking hot and cold, which does make it different to last year. And Ella Philippe's kind of out of the mix. So maybe, yes, there are probably less contenders. The team, there's a slight change in personnel. We have Tim Wellens now. He might add a good, I don't know, a, a different touch to the squad and how they're going to ride him. Maybe if Gorshardner goes, that'll be different as well. But he's more of a mountain guy than a hill kind of specialist. The Rothschild, Davide Formolo, he kind of turns himself inside out all the time uh, for Pogacar in these hilly races. He usually goes to some success, but it didn't work last year. I'm not convinced it'll work this year. I'm just I'm I'm not favorable to the idea of it being a solo winner over the top, especially it being an A-list favorite. We spoke about it last week of um about Tom Pitcock, who I don't believe is going to be in contention this year now that he's um looks to have hurt his hand quite a bit. I I'm I'm skeptical that Bogacci will win. I think I still think we're gonna have a reduced bunch sprint. Yeah. I think you make a good point. I, I, I was literally going to say about Pidcock and how he, he DNF today, so that almost reduces the contenders list even further. I think that Van Aert showed some pretty good flashes at Torreno, so I reckon he will provide some good competition. But like you say, Van der Poel. Yeah, I just think Pogaccia seems to have the least question marks about him at the moment. I think there's certainly the guys like Pedersen, I think, is looking really good. De Lee was a bit MIA as well in Paranis this week, not saying that he's lost form. I think he was just poorly positioned but i do think that pigaccia you know if a group goes over the top kind of similar to 2019 where there was like eight to ten riders i think that he could certainly get away in the uh in the flatter last couple of k's off of the descent of the poggio and solo away to victory i think that it won't he won't win in a sprint but i think a, a move kind of similar to um Mohoric, but but later at the bottom of the of the climb Maybe I th- could work. I think Pogacar could win in a sprint. Yeah, we've I, seen that before. If there's a Pearson, like Liege, Baston Liege kind of thing, yeah, yeah. Well, even even like ten riders. If it's if it's between Mohoric, Wellens, Madouas, Geniets, even Ala Philippe apparently. Ala Philippe, oh, yeah. yeah. There. Come on, don't kid yourself. Valter, he's looked pretty good over the past couple of weeks. Oh, yeah, but he wouldn't beat him. He wouldn't. <laughs> Let's well, well, no, yeah, well. The, the thing is, I'm I'm saying that like Pogaccio would would be like a good yeah exactly that group of of solid riders, but all it takes is for there to be like a sort of Ivan Garcia, Cortina, or a Payson or a Binim Gramai to yeah. to be in the mix, and then that's Pogaccio's sprint kind of scuppered. But he could still finish on the podium. Remember back in um, the Olympic Games in Tokyo, he very almost beat Wavanot in a sprint, came down to a photo yeah. finish. For the bronze medal. He's a good sprinter at, at the end of a hard day. That's all I'm saying. Where do you think Pogac is going to finish this year? First. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. <laughs> I had uh... so much confidence in him winning last year. So I'm I'm hesitant to say that he'll win it this year. Because then, I I mean, it's just going to feel like it's going to be every year. I'm going to have the same discussion about can Pogac is going to win. Yeah. So I'm yeah. going to say it's... I'm going to stick to my guns from the preseason and say it'll it'll be a small bunch sprint but i think he'll finish in top 10 yeah it's the whole favorite and getting swamped on the finish or yeah, just think, being looked at like if he just, just touches his gears on the podio everyone's going to be on him hair on like hair on soap i think yeah. what could make people glitch is if like wellens went up the road and people are like oh but isn't he like pogacha's teammate like what is he doing going up <laughs> Then Wellens yeah. goes on his own all the way to the end. He's a good descender. And then Wellens pulls a Mohoric. And then um, just wins. Yeah. Signing of the season. Like, something like, like like that, where like, well, but he's evidently on good form. He's clicking with the, with the new team, wrote a really good classics um, opening weekend. I wouldn't be surprised if he went off. Maybe even like a Rui Costa. Nah. If oh, <laughs> Gosh, don't, 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 come on. Then Rui Costa's <laughs> not winning this. Nobody's okay. working with, with Rui Costa. He's got a reputation. Not even him. He's not working for himself. Yeah, very true. Very true. Wouldn't trust what? his own shadow. Well, what time did we got you? He was listening in and we just said no. I did. I said he was Oh, yeah, true, true, yeah. Well, but his most loyal, the president of the Liverpool uh, put Tarabagacha fan club, he said no. Oh, dear. He might have to resign after that. Well, it's because Pidcock's just doing shit now, so I have no allegiance to anybody now. So I'm a rogue agent. But anyways, what were we talking about? Three stage wins for Slovenian. And no, not Tad Bogaccio, obviously. Trainer at Jurassico happened as well. Primus Roglic winning that. And we had that unique scene of them swapping the races that they won last year and now each taking that. But anyways, guys, what did you think of Torreno at Jurassico this year? I didn't enjoy it as much as I think I usually do. I'm not sure if I was just because Roglic won so much and it was all just very predictable winners. Like, 
Ganner with a TT, Jakobsen and Phillips and won sprints because they're the fastest guys there. And then Roglic pretty much just took everything else. So I was just like, okay, so that's all pretty predictable. And I don't know. I think perhaps in comparison to Paris Nice, where there was a bit more excitement going on, I just maybe the there was like a headwind on the on the mountain top finish, which wasn't the the greatest thing in terms of. Uh, what, what would you call positive racing as we've been mentioning because it meant that riders were all sitting in for a sprint and then Roglic ended up winning and against just a load of climbers who were just sprinting which is just one of the most ungainly things that you can watch in cycling just this group of like 20 people just hurtling up towards the finish line trying to hit a thousand watts I don't know it was it was all right but I think that I preferred Paranese. Torino Dratico felt like it could have just been an email it could have just been simulated all the all the winners were predictable from Ghana to Jakobsen, Philipson, and then Roglic winning the three mountain stages. It was like Groundhog Day. Control C, Control V on three occasions. It was rather tiresome, to be honest. But, I mean, it was pretty high-level racing in terms of the people there, the contenders and so forth. Yeah, it was pretty good Good riders. A lot of guys that will be seeing clash at Grand Tours later this year, sort of Jai Hindley, Tay Gegenhardt, Joao Meda... Sasha Vlasov, yada, yada, yada. A lot of really strong contenders in, in the mix at the race, but Roglic, despite his hairy legs, I hate the discourse on <laughs> Roglic's legs, by the way. I do too. Awful. But despite the fact he had hairy legs, he still won. He is still a Grand Tour contender. I did see some discourse saying that like Roglic has been sort of written off ever since... Um, Sort of ever since Vingegaard won last year's Tour de France, people have just written him off as like a sort of second tier GC rider, which he's certainly not. I think this this proves it. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, well, thinking now with the we've spoken about the Giro d'Italia that unlike the Paris Nice where we were talking about Jonas Vingor's form not being hundred percent or whatever isn't the biggest uh, problem, but here Torino Adriatico is so much closer to the Giro d'Italia, and well, I mean the Giro d'Italia, uh, the Giro d'Italia, and the Torino Adriatico hasn't really got the best relationship in terms of winners at the one week stage race, and then the Giro. I think 2013 with Nibali is probably the best one we had, the last one. Because uh, last year, obviously, the last two years, obviously, but Tadej Pogacar has won and he hasn't gone to the Giro. But uh, yeah, what do you guys think of Primoz Roglic as potentially the favourite for the Giro? We didn't have Remco Venepo here, for instance. Yeah, and Remco's really the missing factor in all this is that he is just I don't even know what he's doing I can't remember the last time I even saw him but I don't, I'm saying that as if I know him or something I can't remember the last time I saw him on TV as a spectator but I, yeah Remco's the interesting one because of course he beat Roglic at the Vuelta last year so that's something which is worth taking into consideration is that he is technically on a 100% Grand Tour beating record to Roglic so long as Roglic doesn't crash into or whatever way around it was with Fred Wright, whatever way that way round went. I still don't know what the conclusion of that was. I think by that point in the Vuelta, I'd actually just given up on cycling, so I didn't even really know. But I think that Remco is the interesting one. I think there's quite a lot of TTKs, and I'd favour Remco in the TTs over Roglic, even though Roglic is also very good. I just think that Remco... Olympic champion. Of course, yeah. Uh, I just think, yeah, I don't know, something about Remco. I think that for me... Uh, he is still the favourite in my eyes, but I do still have Roglic as a very close second. He's certainly much better in terms of favourite status than the guy like Thomas, for example. But that's just that's just my opinion on it. I don't feel like we have enough sort of case studies for Rimko A for the Paul. Yes, the Buelta last year, he was brilliant there. But he's the only rider in that peloton who targeted the Buelta all year round, who had the Buelta as their only um, sort of objective. Every other rider that was there, Roglic, Mas, a lot of them did other races and so forth, where Remco just was dropped into the welter. We forget in 2021 at the Giro that um, he sort of came unstuck very quickly in that race. Yeah, maybe it was the injury and so forth. But it's not just the Giro that's happened in. A, a plenty of other UCI World Tour stage races. The Tour of the Basque Country, 2022. Tour de Suisse, 2022. Volta Andalucia, 2022. Uh, the, 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 there are so many examples you, you can bring up. I think we only really have two good legitimate UCI World Tour races as case studies for Avon Nepal as being su such a dominant force, being the Buelta and the uh, UAE Tour this year. 
ever since his big crash in 2020. So I'm a little bit, it's, it's hard to pick Remco as his out and out favorite because there are so many question marks that still need to be answered. On paper, yes, he's definitely the, the stronger time trialist. He's good enough in the mountains. I mean, he's got the position to take the pink jersey on very early in this race, like he did at the Vuelta and hold it all the way to the end. But I think there's a more competitive field here with more people targeting the Giro. It's not the afterthought that the Vuelta Espana usually is. We're not going to see sort of a sort of chaotic top 10 fight like we do at the Vuelta. I think the Giro is a little bit more regimented, even if it is sort of slightly unpredictable here and then. But it also, I mean, it, it will be an ultimate test. I think Roglic is more proven in that field. We have so many more sort of case studies for Roglic doing well at Grand Tours, looking at Tour de France 2018, Giro 2019, Vuelta, 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 Tour, whatever combination you want to go in. We have so many more sort of examples for Roglic. Uh, yes, comparing his last Tirreno win in 2019 to this season, um, maybe he peaked too early for that season, but he also had a much busier schedule in 2019 than he does in 2023. So I'm still optimistic that Roglic will be there to sort of fight against Avonapol and also Thomas and also Sasha Vlasov and so forth and these other other riders. Yeah, and then there's also the thing of, like you said, Avonapol's victories, like the major ones in World Tour, have all been in very uh, warm climates, let's say. Whereas the Giro is renowned for having unpredictable, cold, rainy weather, of which Avonapool has not performed in as well that, that we know of. This isn't to say that he's he's bad. It's just that we haven't really seen the bad weather and him racing yeah. in a competitive sense combined together. We don't actually we just don't know if that's a thing. Whereas we have seen that with Roglic, we have seen him perform in bad weather conditions. I mean, just look at Terreno, just gone. There were. There, there was some there was some rain there and he was he was seemed to be coping just fine on that mountain top finish. So I'd say that yeah, Roglic perhaps has the the advantage in terms of weather conditions, just because we know more about him. Then there's the whole thing of the team as well. We, you know, we're we're speculating about who a Jumbo gonna send to the tour. Of course they'd probably favour sending a better team to the tour than the Giro. Roglic's ambitions would probably be taking a, a hit before Jonas's in in that sense. But Quick Step are also sending a strong team, and I think that they're really kind of level pegging in terms of quality. But I certainly think that Jumbo are perhaps a more regimented and a well drilled, experienced team as opposed to Quick Step, who have really been not cobbled together, but they've they've formed rather quickly into a unit. And I still feel like they they're yet to fully gel into a into a complete outfit to support Avonapool. It doesn't quite have that experience that I feel like is sometimes necessary to surround a leader, especially one as young as, as Avonapool. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think as well, um, with Avonapool, I think there is sort of there are so many unknowns where in Roglic that someone else can slip into that team and I think they can wing it more than than Quick Step can. I think Quick Step they won't know how to wing it. Last year the Buelta we saw a couple times like Avonapool was on his own. He had the advantage of having other teams controlling things like Movistar and Astana and so forth. Whereas uh, Sudal weren't really there in contention. So I mean, then the Giro will be harder. It's a harder race to control. Yeah, we'll see how they uh, rise to the occasion. They've got some new signings, some strong climbers coming to the Giro, but I'm not convinced it's going to be as, as dominant as we might assume, especially given that Rocklich is looking quite good because we weren't sure where he'd be. Yeah, I, I don't think we need to discuss Sasha. <laughs> He's had enough airtime on this channel. He was also <laughs> pretty shocking at Toronto. I didn't even yeah. realize he was there. To be honest, I was like, well, yeah. he, he was working as a teammate the whole time, and on, yeah. on the penultimate stage, he attacked. He got yeah. the provisional jersey. Everything came back together, and he got dropped straight away because because they were working for Kemner and yeah. Hinley, and then Kemner wasn't really there. And yeah. I, I'm sorry, Jai, Jai Hinley's a one hit wonder. He'll never win a <sighs> again. He was on the podium in 2020. I'm sorry, that was the COVID Oof. edition. That was strange. Uh, Tegek and Hart's never going to finish on the yeah. podium of Grand Tour ever again. Damn right. Preach that. I believe in... I feel, Tegek and Hart is so overrated. Criminally and, so. Uh, he literally is. I don't even get it. Like, his contract is running out at Ineos awesome. and they should not renew it. He's going to end up on the Conti scene. And then he'll slowly fizzle away in the depths of Samparan. Right. Um, well, sticking with Torino, actually... <laughs> Well, anyway, sticking with Terreno Atletico, we also had the flat stages, and obviously Binyam Gumay is one of the hot talking points this year. He won a stage in the Tour of Valenciana, but 
Uh, he is the pride and joy of Intermarché One Two Group Gobert. Really, the front figure. He got two top fives, one top three, but he wasn't quite there with the fast men. And we said he was similar to Peter Sagan. And do you think this is? Yeah, I don't know. Do you think Binyam Gumai is just not that upper echelon of sprinters? I think our comparison to early days Sagan is still incredibly valid if not if 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 not the results which he's been getting here it's just been solidifying that point because those sort of yeah Binny just finishes like four fifth six in sprints and that's generally where early early doors Sagan tended to reside in the sprints the the flat ones that is and I just think that Binny is I don't even know what it is but he just always seems to be not in particularly great position or he's he's usually quite isolated and he's moving up in the wind an awful lot and he's just kind of using up that sprint energy trying to move up from 10th wheel to 5th wheel and I just think that it's maybe just an experience thing maybe it's Intermarche aren't experienced enough in the lead out maybe the lead out's not good enough maybe it's it's I think it's multifactorial I don't think it's just Binny in terms of out and out speed no I probably wouldn't put him on the level of Philipson but I don't think that he's like massively far off, but I think that he's more versatile than than Philipson is. I think that trying, I think that Binny trying to turn himself into an out and out bunch sprinter like a Philipson, a Jakobsen, Glunewagen, exam for example. That's not really Binny's style. I think that he um he he's better as a versatile sprinter and like Sagan, like we've said multiple times. And I think that yes, his positioning and multiple things in his sprinting. In these, port, in these pure bunch sprints could be better, which would certainly help for a green jersey stab, for example. But I think that he's doing okay. There are a couple of things he could do better, but he's yeah, he's he's not bad. I'm trying to I'm trying to dig, dig up a stat right now, and um, I'm struggling to sort of okay. So outside of Biniam um win at the Giro, he's never taken a stage of a UCI World Tour stage race. I am I, I'm currently going through all the green jersey winners of the Tour de France. All the way down to the 1980s. Yes, this is before the Twitter. This is before the UCI before World Tour existed. Any one here exists. Wow. Races such like a, a Catalonia, Pyrenees, a Tirreno. They've all they've all won a stage of Pyrenees, Tirreno, Catalonia. These kind of races before winning the green jersey. Benim Gramai has not done that yet. He's not going to win the green jersey this year if we follow that trend, which seems harsh to say. But um, history does seem to sort of repeat itself. The Tour de France is a huge step up from the Giro. And um, yes, he, he was up there in contention for Amalia Ciclamino at the Giro. But that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be going for a green jersey. Giacomo Nizzolo has won multiple points jerseys at the Giro. Has he ever come close to winning a Tour de France one? No. no. Nassel Buani has, has won a points jersey at the Giro. He's never going to win one at, at, at the Tour de France. Fernando Gaudia, for instance, has won one at the Giro. That's not won one at, at the Tour de France. I, I just think in terms of historical trends, it's not pointing towards a positive trajectory, maybe in sort of two or three years, yes. Once Antimarché as a team collectively mature their sprinting train, because Binny and Grimai seems to be dumped about sixth wheel um, with no leader man in the final 500 meters of a sprint stage. And he's he's surfing the wheels, he's eating wind, and he gets boxed in. That's not how you win a green jersey. He might come third, fourth, or fifth in that, but he needs to, he needs yeah. to up that game and up that. The, the leader training he needs to be spot on, especially at a Tour de France when you're going to have Sudal Quickstep, who are going to bring Florian Seneschal, Mikael Merko, Bertrand Leber here with, with a Fabio Jacobs and Tim O'Lear at the end of the train. Hunebeek has got a great train with Luca Mesquets, for instance. There are so many str- teams with stronger leadouts that Binion Grimai is going to find it hard. Yes, he can probably surf the wheels at a Giro finish and finish in top four, but a Tour de France, it's very hard to do that. Sagan did it, yes, but that took years for Sagan to get to that point. Winning Pyrenees stages in 2010, two years later, he won a green jersey. We haven't seen Binion Grimai win a Tirreno stage, a Pyrenees stage, or any of those kind of level stages so I, i'm skeptical to say the green jerseys right on the horizon maybe wait until 2025 the similarities is quite funny because well okay uh peter scan did the welter before but he's 22 peter scan was 22 <laughs> he's going to be debuting his first tour de france obviously he didn't finish the giro last year which that is one of the criteria if you're going to win the points jersey but do you not think with what we not as we <coughs> mentioned earlier potentially having to be more focused now on Vingegaard duties. So he's not going to be able to do his little pet project. Oh, that's um, As UAE are going to be very strong, so he's going to need more support Vingegaard and thereby 
that kind of frees up the green jersey competition and the sprinters don't really seem too bothered to go up the road and chase the intermediate sprint which Bini Gumai could potentially do yeah I, I do think you're right that yeah Wout Van Aert especially it depends on what his goals are for this of course he got the green jersey last year is that just the box which he wanted to tick and then he's just kind of quite content with not doing that again and just maybe he'll go for some stages but not focus on the green jersey maybe that's the case but then again you, you never know a young Bavisma they are very smoke and mirrors they keep their cards close to their chest you never really know what they're planning on doing so i always take whatever they say with a pinch of salt but binny does have the capabilities going up the road but i'm not sure the tour route this year seems to favor perhaps the pure sprinters because of the way that the points classification weighting goes towards just the pure flat stages but binny if he finishes inside the top five in in those pure flat sprints but then gets up the road then for sure i think that he could be contesting the green jersey but like you was saying it's it's gonna be quite hard to come in immediately into the biggest stage in cycling that he's never done before and he's gonna be doing something which he hasn't really done before which is really focusing upon the the niches and the nuances Mm -hmm. of the point system that's dished out in the tour it's a thing which perhaps you need the experience of knowing when to invest energy and when to not. For example, if Binny invests a lot of energy into a medium mountain stage to try and win an intermediate sprint, but then ends up doing really crap the day after in a pure bun sprint because he's absolutely knackered, then that's a bad call to have made. And I think maybe it's a thing which it might be a bit of a push this year, but with with time, Binny, I think I'd be surprised if in, if throughout Binny's career he didn't win a green jersey. I think that's the main point which I'm wanting to take away from this. Yeah, I think it is hard to sort of jump in and um, and get the green jersey immediately. It's very rare. I think only sort of generational talent. Although Binny Gramai is a generational talent, I think putting him next to the names of sort of Pogacha jumping in and getting the yellow jersey, for instance, Sagan getting the green jersey as well. Even Egan Badenal, it took him a year to really warm up to, to the GC game. Wout Van Aert rode three tours to France before he went for the green jersey, let's not forget. And even wearing the other jersey, it took him three tours to France before getting to that point. Van der Poel, yes, he parachuted in and got his stage win on stage two. But it, it does take these generational talents to get that. Maybe Bidim Gumai is not in that place yet, but he's just got to learn from this first tour to France, probably sort of get to grips with it. It's a very different beast too, the, the, the Giro d'Italia. And Binyam Gamay has not ridden that many UCI World Tour races. I know I always bang on about the UCI World Tour level. Binyam Gamay needs to get needs to get used to ride, riding these sort of top World Tour level races. The it's the top. same caveat I have I have with Arno Delis yeah. as well. In terms of Delis has done really well in the Ronde von Gent, Ronde von Dürne, Ronde von Imet, Met de Slag, whatever. Like yeah. all these like like GP old belgian man like it's all these like races that aren't quite on the same level as as a sort of a top level race yes Benim Gamay won the tour of flanders he won that as a wild card as a bit of an underdog yes he was on our radars but sorry what he won he won against wavel wait what did i say tour of flanders tour of flanders i meant against wavel <laughs> Kim. Sorry. Oh, dear. Don't worry. Um, Oh dear. The tour of um, East Flanders. I mean, he, he uh, would and, probably yeah, won that I mean, now. He won that sort of a bit of a wild card. Put a target on his back and I think it'll be different. Yeah, and I think Yamba Visma as well also kind of made a bit, a bit of a whoopsie that day. But um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I have some reserves. Yeah, and it's also the thing where he he won't have like a whole team around him more than likely, whereas a Philipson and a Jakobsen slash Merlier will have an absolute eight-man team like around them you know maybe they'll have one or two climbers in there but Binny will likely have a, quite a split team with riders like Mienkes, Kalmajan, Robocosans for example all going for the breakaways and those guys are not used to being involved in a lead out and therefore like we said we've talked about how Binny gets really well positioned from 5k to 2k but it's those last and you're always like oh he's in good position oh he's going to like then he's gonna the lead out medal kind of weed out and then he'll be in third wheel but then he always gets shuffled back and it's just a thing where Intermarche perhaps in the coming years will make some signings and perhaps bolster their ability to to help Binny in a similar way to how Quickstep have had to bolster their GC team to to help Avonapool what's a shame is that um so Danny von Poppel used to ride for Intermarche oh he did didn't uh, he and he left in 2022. A point of regret there. What? Why did they let Fun Popple go? Because he would have been the perfect guy to guide Binny Binny in. 
and Tomas actually have a couple of good sprinters, but we don't know what Kjeta Batesen and Ugo Pash are going to bring in terms of a lead-out train. So, yeah, I mean, there's plenty there, there's plenty to be answered to. There's also a sort of extra sort of caveat as well, because Antimarche have never won a Tour de France stage. They've been here since, what, 2017? They've had Guillaume Martin get top 20 in GC for a couple of years. Yes, he used to ride for this squad, by the way. They've had sort of Zandra Murdesa in top 20 in GC, but they've not really done anything else. Taco van der Horn came pretty close to a stage win, but they haven't got one yet. I think going in a breakaway is an easier bet. Trying to get a win th- from a breakaway stage from Louis Mankies. He's won Vuelta stages. He's won sort of decent races in terms of in climbing in a breakaway, yada, yada. Get him a Koba Hosens, a Leon Kalamajan to go to a breakaway and win win a stage that way instead of sort of putting all your eggs in a sprinting basket. Because on the stage, for instance, to Nagoro, on the motor sports track, it's a pan flat day. That's probably going to go to Jasper Philipsen or Jakobsen. There's no way Benin Grimai wins that, I'm afraid. So it, it, it's just more of a risky game to put all of your sort of resources into Grimai. I think you're right. But yeah, I mean, it's still impressive that we're sitting here talking about a yeah, Trey and 22 year old potentially mm. be in the conversation for a green jersey, but eventually yeah. he will, we think. I would love nothing more this year than to see Benny win a stage of a tour. It would really make for tour i think it'll be it'll be fantastic to see air trail would completely just you could see air trail from the moon probably if that happened and then yeah. he puts on his then he puts on his goggles and goes onto the podium and he's like it's just to try and not get wiped out the race by a prosecco cork yeah he's gonna he, he he's gonna be wary it wouldn't be prosecco though it would be champagne but at the oh, tour of course yeah sorry they don't, they don't give um they don't give our sparkling wine on the podium so he's safe he's safe in in, in that regard oh there you go um, but I think there's a certain there's a certain world championships happening that would also suit him. So I think tuning up through mm. July into August for the world championships would make sense. Absolutely. I think I think he's got bigger fish to fry this year than um Tirreno Adriatico. But anyways, coming to our favorite part of the show and what main many pros are waiting for in anticipation, rider <laughs> of the week. Probably not no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, well. You and we know who you're going for, so we don't need to go there. No, I'm checking. Who are you going for, you and surprise? I mean, us. he won. He won three stages who? in who? three different Rockledge. ways. Rockledge. R- Rockledge didn't did win three <laughs> stages in three different ways. Rockledge um, held on to to a group of GC favorites and sprinted quite well in the final 300 meters of three days in a row. Whereas Pogaccia, three different days, three different kind of ways of winning. I think he had more pressure on his back there than Rockledge probably did. And with Vingago in company too, it's Paris Nice. I'm sorry, I am. I am always going to back Paris Nice. It's a mini Tour de France, and it's probably the most important tune-up race, I would say. So yeah, I, I got you. Uh, yeah, I never said his name. <laughs> just had to bring us presume like who? Who's he talking about? Well, you could have been talking about my rider a week, David Godu. I don't know. Just his performance this week has been my outstanding performance because I didn't really predict that. I thought, you know, oh, it's going to be another go-do performance. He'll come top five in, in GC at Paranese. But the fact of the matter is, is that he finished above Jonas Vingegaard, who won the Tour last year. And he is now being talked about as maybe finishing on the podium at the Tour de France. And I think that it was an outstanding performance from Godu, the highest caliber performance I've ever seen him do. And I think that roll on July. I can't wait to see what him and Group Palmer FDJ are going to do. I mean, obviously, I'm going to be super impartial and I'm going to pick uh, Jonas Vingegaard. No, that's not true. The other Jonas. <laughs> Jonas Gregor for winning the Polka Dot jersey. I think it's probably the one of the biggest results. It's definitely the biggest result for him. Uh, you would say as a rider, he's kind of been up at Astana and then kind of down to Uno X. But I mean, yeah, I think... Uno X, this is a massive result for them as well as a team. It's not a victory, but it's something. It's, it's the first like yeah. proper thing from a World Tour race. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah they've got top tens with um, Tobias Harlan Johannesen, and and the score set came very close to winning a Dauphiné stage last year. But this is definitely the biggest yeah. thing they've got from a World Tour race that's... in their Tour de France debut year. They got a stage of a Saudi Tour. That's, that's not a World Tour race. <laughs> Just, if anybody oh. cares. Wow, yeah. just say straight right. facts. Also, Come on. <laughs> on the on the Scandinavian front as well, a really strong ride from a nineteen year old Perstrand Hagenas from Jumbo Visma. Great little kid. Uh, he won the Ronde von Drenthe today. Yeah. Sailing away from he's nineteen. Come on, <laughs> sailing away from from a strong field, including Sam Wellsford, uh, Milan Menta, and a couple of other really strong riders who have had good results over the past couple of weeks. So at the age of nineteen and doing that. 
it's impressive. Can't wait for him to join Yumbo Visma so that the domination can continue. (laughs) Uh, Can't wait. (laughs) And so the infernal cycle continues. Oh, God. (laughs) But anyways, that's basically it. Make sure to check out our podcast on all the different platforms down in the description below. Subscribe to the channel. Comment down below what your ride of the week as well has been. And of course, as always, thank you for watching and we'll see you next week. Thank you.